Welcome to the Intermarket Analysis video update. This is a video that I do once a week where I look not only inside the S&P 500, we look outside of the S&P 500 at other indexes and other sectors, and we also look at other markets because no market exists in a vacuum and they often interact with each other. Sometimes that's very apparent, other times it's not quite so obvious, but we still wanna keep an eye on these other markets just to get some insight or clues as to what is ultimately happening with the S&P 500. And then this can also help you if you invest in individual stocks because stocks have a tendency to move with their respective indexes. This is being prepared for Monday, February 12th. The first area that we look at is just within the S&P 500 itself. We look at valuation. We look at some other indexes as well to get a comparison. But we want to know, is the market considered to be expensive, fairly priced, or cheap? If you do more of a fundamental analysis approach to investing, you like to buy stocks when they're considered inexpensive or cheap, and then you might look to sell stocks when they start to get expensive. You may use that as more of a mechanism of, of, for timing. And then when, as long as you fit the parameters of what you're looking for, like earnings keep going up and prices and getting too out of hand, you hold on to that investment. Then when it gets to the point where earnings aren't quite keeping up with price, that's when you look at, okay, maybe it's time to get out of this particular investment. We also look at this because we don't use this to make decisions. We just get some information on what is the current status of the market. The first chart that we look at, we look at a PE ratio of 10, 15, and 20. These are static numbers that the market has come up with to try to determine if we're fairly priced, expensive, or inexpensive. And we compare that to the current price of the S&P 500. And you can see on the top where the black line, the S&P is well above the red dashed line, which is a PE ratio of 20. Now, one thing to be aware of, this valuation method looks backwards. This is called TTM or the trailing 12 months. On the bottom, I also break that out. It's a little easier to see. When we're above zero, that means that we're above the PE ratio of 20. And so on a historical basis, the market is considered to be expensive. But it's been this way for quite a while. You can see that there's years when we are above this red dash line. That's why it's really difficult to use this as some kind of a timing mechanism. Then this is a very similar chart put out by Real Investment Advice, and it pretty much shows the same thing, these different areas and then where price is in relation to the PE ratios. Then this also tries to plot some historical events that have happened and what the historical valuations were at that time. And way up on the right-hand side, that's where we were at right now. Another way to take this is to use past information and then spread it out over a period of time. And this was developed by Robert Schiller called the Schiller PE ratio. We get more of a smooth effect with this. And the current reading coming in over on the right-hand side is 33.83. To give us some context, we can look at a historical chart and you can see that we're pretty high. There's other times, this goes all the way back to the 1800s. We had the 1929 crash and the valuation was actually a little bit below where we're at right now before things really went down. Then you have the 87 crash, which the earnings were quite a bit lower. And then we were able to recover after that. And then you get a perspective on where we're at over on the right-hand side. We can also look at the median and the mean, which is anywhere between 16 and 17. And we're pretty much double that right now. So yeah, both when we look at the more raw values for the PE ratio, we are considered to be expensive. When we take a more smooth approach, we're also expensive. But as I said before, we can go on in this situation for a long time. Then the market likes to look forward. And I was able to find more of a chart that I like to use for a representation. The market looks forward with PE ratios. And we also measure those on that same 10, 15, 20 scale. The red line is the S&P 500 and the forward looking ratio based on analyst projections and forecasts, we're starting to get above 20 right now as the S&P has been going up. You can see up at the top, we are at 20.4 as of Friday's closed. You can also compare that to the mid caps, which currently has a PE ratio of 15.1. So they're 
fairly priced looking forward. And then we look at small caps, which are at 14.3. They're just under that fairly priced level. And just to give some more context, this also marks different bear markets that happened. Those are in red. And then corrections, which means that we fell 10% or more. Those are in blue. So you can kind of see where we're going. Since I don't actually have a chart of the S&P on this particular chart that we're showing. We can also look ahead to see, and this is also put out by Real Investment Advice, the projections going forward. And I've used this chart for the past few weeks. And it says earnings estimates are well ahead of economic realities. And we've been seeing a little bit of a downshift over the last oh, maybe year or so, six months to a year, as earnings projections are coming down. And then companies come out with their earnings reports and they're like, wow, they beat the earnings estimate and the stock goes up. Yeah, that's a little game that goes on, but it's a game that we know about. And sometimes a company can come out with an earnings report and it just looks amazing and the stock tanks. Well, sometimes you're a victim of the buy the rumor, sell the news. A stock price may be really going up into an earnings report. Then when that report is released, even if it's great, they start selling the stock. Another one may be that the stock is just kind of languishing and it comes out with an earnings report that the market really likes and it really shoots higher. Or it can also disappoint and earnings will go lower. This just gives us an idea of where the S&P was at at the time this chart was drawn based on the historical earnings and then what the projections are going forward. And the kind of the takeaway from this is that the earnings projections are going up. Yeah, they might be becoming unrealistic, but at the same time, the market uses this to justify prices going higher. This is another thing, looking at consensus earnings per share, it typically gets th cut through the fiscal year in March, this is what tends to happen. And think about this. This kind of makes sense. When you're looking way out into the future, things look a lot brighter. You think a company is going to make a lot more money. And so analysts come up with this really kind of pie in the sky number. Well, as we get closer and closer to that particular earnings report, we start getting more into reality. And we follow this yellow line where revisions are usually revised down. And that's what typically happens. This dark blue line, this is what happened in 2023. They started off pretty strong and then started to get revised down. The light blue line, this is what's been happening so far in 2024. And yes, the tendency is to revise them down because real things are coming more into focus. And as we get closer to that report, the market has to adjust for that. Then another area that we look at is growth versus value. When growth is doing well, the indexes tend to do well. When the indexes are under pressure, that's when value tends to outperform. First area that we look at is just a growth index. And we are in an uptrend and been showing some improvement when just looking at growth by itself. We also look at value by itself. And it's also in an uptrend. It hasn't really been breaking out as much, but it's still been hanging in there for right now. Where we get some insight is when we do a ratio between the two. On top, we have the growth to value ratio, showing that growth is outperforming. And then on the bottom, we have a value to growth ratio, showing how value is underperforming. And I explain this every time. You can see the little bit of an offset here when we saw the moving average crossover. That's why sometimes it helps to look <clears throat> at one version of the chart and then look at an inverse version. You might see things that you didn't see before. And sometimes they're calculated in slightly different ways that's why we look at ETFs, we look at sectors, we look at a lot of different things to try to see if everything is lining up in the same direction. But this chart right now is just showing that growth is outperforming value. Here's an ETF showing that growth is also outperforming value. We were coming down, we started to see a death cross here with this ratio, but now we're starting to come back up and it's turning back and looking more positive. Here's an inverse of that same chart where value was showing some strength right at the end of 2023. Now it's starting to come back down on a relative basis. And here's another index look more longer term showing that growth is outperforming value, but we're still seeing the blue line under the red line. So it's still in a downtrend, but it is showing some improvement. And here's another look at value versus growth, kind of an inverse, but then more of a blown up chart showing how value since the beginning of 2024 has been underperforming growth and is in an overall downtrend.
And we look at another index measure here showing how growth is outperforming value. Then another measure using some ETFs where growth is really outperforming value here. We're above all the lines in this rainbow, but we haven't come back to this previous high yet set back in 2021. If this keeps going up, that would be more positive for the market. If this starts to turn and go down as it did in 2022, that tends to put the market under pressure. Here's an inverse of that same chart showing how value has been underperforming and continues to do so. We also break out and look at the small caps. And for a lot of 2022 and into 2023, we were chopping more or less sideways. And this was getting kind of frustrating. Well, just lately, we're seeing a real breakout when we look at small cap growth to small cap value. The small caps have been very frustrating. There's supposed to be this thing called the January effect. And in the month of December, it did great. This is when we saw the small caps really going up when we just look at the index. But then we hit January and it's like we came down and we've been chopping more or less sideways. The fact that we're seeing growth starting to break out, that could be positive for the small caps, but we're just not seeing that yet in the index. We also look at mid caps and we're seeing a similar thing, although the mid caps were a little bit stronger. They have a more solid uptrend. They weren't as range bound as small caps. And this is starting to break out where we haven't necessarily seen that yet when we look at the index. But longer term, this could be potentially positive. Now, one scenario, just to keep in your mind, it may not play out this way. And we can use this scenario with the large caps, mid caps, and small caps. We could potentially be getting into a period of time from about the middle of February till the mid to latter part of March that tends to be weak even though things are still fairly positive. We're quite overbought right now with the market. And at some point, there's a chance that we might see a pullback. What we're going to be watching, if that ends up happening, <clears throat> what is growth to value doing for the small caps, mid caps, and large caps? If we see this ratio continuing to go up, that just means, okay, once this decline gets over, there's a real likelihood that stocks could go up after that. If we see a real decline in the ratio as stocks are going down, that may cause us some more concern. Just something to think about. I'm not predicting anything. I'm just trying to give you some insights as to things to be aware of if we start to enter that kind of a phase. Here's the growth to value ratio for the S&P, which had been really showing some weakness here, even though the S&P was going up. That was a negative divergence. And then we started to chop more or less sideways. But during that time, we started to see growth outperforming value. And that really has given some more strength to the S&P 500 itself. We also like to keep a look on at inflation. And we're going to get the two, two of the bigger reports this week. We're going to get CPI, which is the big one, and then we're going to get PPI. That'll also be coming out. The first area that we look at here is the CRB index, because these are commodities. And we look at a monthly chart of the CRB index, which has pretty much been chopping sideways in the longer term. And we're going down when we measure inflation and compare it to deflation when looking at this chart. Then we look at the CRB all by itself, where it's still in a downtrend, even though it has been bouncing up lately, but it's been chopping more or less sideways for the last couple of weeks. We look at the Baltic Dry Index. When this goes up, that typically means it costs more to ship products. When it goes down, that means there are less. We're still in a longer term uptrend, even though the Baltic Dry Index has been coming down. And folks like to shift this forward and compare it with this different stock indexes. I don't do that. I just look at a plain index chart above of the S&P 500 and just the regular Baltic dry index on the bottom with a couple of moving average averages plotted over that. You might want to take this to another level and try to get some insight from that. But I found that just looking at this seems to do a good enough job. Some other markets that we keep an eye on are aluminum, even though we don't actively talk about these, we just want to watch them. We are still in a downtrend when it comes to aluminum. Corn is still in a downtrend. Wheat continues to be in a downtrend. Fertilizers chopping back up a little bit, but it's in a longer term downtrend. Oil is kind of chopping all over the place. And we're kind of, it's really hard to tell here, but we've been kind of still in a downtrend when you take this all together. And this is just to look at different events that have happened. I've used this chart before. When we really spiked up in oil, that was the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war. And then we started to fall back down. 
This other little spike up, that's when things started to escalate in Israel. And then we've been coming back down. And we really haven't broken out of that range since then. We do keep an eye on gas. It really spiked up, but then is now starting to come back down. And gas is also in a downtrend, which is probably something you like as a consumer. And then we look at diesel, which also has been declining. And heating oil going back up a little bit, but is still in a downtrend. Natural gas also continues to be in a downtrend. Copper, this is more of a barometer of the economy. When this is going up, we tend to look better economically. When this is going down, that tends to suggest some economic weakness. We're still in an uptrend here, but we've been really chopping all around as the market figures out, okay, is the economy looking better going forward or is it looking weaker going forward? And copper really hasn't been all that decisive in helping with that. We look at a copper to gold ratio. Again, copper tends to be more tied to what we look to happen as far as economically. And then gold tends to be more of a safe haven when things are going crazy. When we do the ratio between the two, we show that copper has been underperforming gold. We also look at a longer term chart. The ratio is the black line here. And for the most part, this has been going down. We also plot the two-year and the 10-year yield on here, which have been coming down since about October of 2023. But now we're starting to see interest rates going back up. We're also noticing that the, there's a really wide spread between the green line, the red line, and the black line, where typically they don't get all that far apart from each other, even though they're on different scales, and they have a tendency to move in the same general direction. We're seeing that things are not really going in that kind of a uniform manner right now as the market's possibly shifting into another type of phase, at least when we look at the economy. We keep an eye on gold, which still tends to be in an uptrend, but is not breaking out a way a lot of the gold so-called experts tend to think that it will. But no matter what happens with gold, they can justify its current price. We look at silver, which is actually starting to see more of a downtrend now. We've seen a death cross here with the silver ETF, and it's actually been declining. And then we look at gold and silver together, where we have in the end of day value with gold, the end of day value with silver. And you can just see by comparing these two charts how silver has been underperforming. We look at the correlation on the bottom. Now, typically, they will have a very strong correlated relationship, but lately it's been more neutral as gold has been seeing a little more strength as silver has been seeing more weakness. Then this is something that is usually, well, sometimes this can be helpful, but right now it's not helping us all that much. We take a gold to silver ratio on top. If this is going up. That means gold is outperforming. And then in the middle area, we plot the U.S. dollar index. And then sometimes there's a strong correlation between the two, but right now it's not all that strong. So this chart really hasn't been helping us all that much. Here's the dollar index, a daily chart, where it has been really rebounding since the beginning of 2024, but we're still in a longer term downtrend. We compare this with the euro, which the dollar has been gaining some ground with the euro. That's why we're seeing that going down as the dollar index has been going up. And we also look at the Japanese yen, which has been in a downtrend when compared to the dollar. So we just look at an isolated chart of the euro to the dollar. The euro is still in an uptrend, but it has been underperforming since the beginning of the year. If we stay underneath these moving averages, we might see a death cross where the euro starts to underperform the dollar. The dollar is also outperforming the Japanese yen, or to put it in another way, the Japanese yen is underperforming the dollar and is still in a downtrend. The British pound has also been pulling back lately, but it still is in a longer term uptrend when compared to the dollar. Some index ratios, and I show this in every daily video. This past week, we're seeing a bit of an improvement with the red line. That's the S&P equal weight index. The S&P 500 index is a weighted index. So the big mega caps, they account for more movement of the index itself. To get a better perspective on things, we use the equal weight index because it treats all of the stocks in the S&P the same. And when this red line is going up, that means there's more broad participation in the market. And we look at a ratio between the two. And for a large part of 20, or actually for all of 2023, we take this ratio. And when this is going down, that means that the equal weight index is underperforming the S&P. To put that another way, that means the mega caps really held the market together in 2023. 
we started to see a bit of a bounce as we got into the latter part of 2023, but now this ratio continues to go down as the mega caps still continue to lead the way higher, even though the equal weight index has been showing some strength, but that's been very recent. Here's a ratio between the S&P 500 stocks and the CRB index commodities showing how stocks are outperforming. Here's an inverse of that showing how commodities are underperforming. Then we look at the NASDAQ 100, which is setting all-time highs, and the S&P 500, which is also setting all-time highs and just crossed above 5,000 for the first time in Friday's session. But when we compare the two, the NASDAQ 100 continues to outperform. Now, you might think, okay, I'm just going to jump into the NASDAQ 100. That's okay when things are really going up, and you can see some really nice returns. But if we hit a time like we did in 2022, the NASDAQ 100 really tends to underperform. What goes up faster has a tendency to go down faster as well. Just something to be aware of there. We also compare the biggest stocks in the S&P, which is the S&P 100, to the S&P 500, and it shows that the bigger stocks are outperforming. The NASDAQ, which has been doing okay, but it's not back to an all-time high yet, That where the NASDAQ 100 has been setting all-time highs. And we compare that with, with the S&P 500, showing how the NASDAQ is continuing to outperform. And here's the NASDAQ 100 and the NASDAQ, which both have been doing well, but the NASDAQ 100 is even doing better. That's why we're seeing this ratio really going up. Then we look at mega cap growth, the big mega magnificent seven companies. There's probably some other ones included in there. And we compare it with the equal weight index. And this is showing how the mega caps are continuing to really outperform. We also keep a real close eye on small caps. And this, as I said earlier, has been really kind of disappointing. We saw some improvement in the latter part of 2023. That's the red line. When this is going up, that means the small caps are outperforming. When this is going down, that means the small caps are underperforming. We could be seeing some improvement with the small caps, but we're not really seeing that yet with, with the index. And then the blue line up here is the S&P 500 to give us some perspective. We look at the small cap ratio to the S&P 500, showing how it has been underperforming, even though we've seen a bounce recently. The 30 biggest software companies in the U.S., they were showing some weakness in the latter part of 2023. Now they're starting to bounce back and they're more in an uptrend. The mega caps, this is what you hear about in the financial media all the time. They continue to be really strong and continue to set new all-time highs with this ETF. Robotics, that's one of the real rages now in the AI ETF. It's back to going into an uptrend. But when we compare it to the tech sector, it still continues to underperform. The tech sector is still doing better. The Dow Jones Composite Average takes the Dow, the transports, and the utilities and puts them together. A lot of the strength that we're seeing right now is really the Dow itself, and that's in an uptrend. The transports are negatively diverging, which I'll talk more about, and the utilities have been under a lot of weakness lately. So really, it's the Dow that is kind of shining to make this average look better. Then we look at the S&P 500 and shorter-term bonds, and this is suggesting on a shorter-term basis that stocks are outperforming bonds. Then we look at a thing called the S&P 1500, which is another broad market measure, and also compare it with shorter-term bonds, and we can see that stocks are outperforming. Then we look at another broad market index, and we go a little further out with bonds, and this also suggests that stocks are really outperforming bonds. We look at the low volatility ETF, which has pretty much been chopping sideways, but it's still in a longer term uptrend. We compare that, though, with the S&P 500, which has been going up. And with the low volatility ETF going sideways, it is really underperforming and starting to really break down, meaning that the S&P is performing a lot better than the low volatility ETF. We look at the tech sector and compare it with three to seven year bonds, showing how the tech sector is continuing to outperform. Then we look at some other stocks, and I show this in every daily video. We just want to keep an eye on what's happening with the advanced decline line. This can give us some clues as to internally what's happening. We're seeing some improvement with the NYSE common stock. We're actually breaking out and held up better with the S&P 500, so that's looking the strongest right now. We're seeing some improvement with the mid caps, but we're not back to this previous high. We're seeing some improvement with the small caps, and it's just getting back above the moving average, but still is not coming back to even a shorter term high, let alone this other high that was set back in December. 
Then we look at Dow theory, and this is where we're seeing a negative divergence. We have the Dow, even though it was down in Friday's session, it's coming off of setting recent all-time highs. Well, the transports have not, now they've been able to come back to this previous high, but then we have this high set earlier in 2023. We haven't come back to that level yet. So this is a negative divergence. This is something that's been a concern to us, but it's also longer term. And if the transports could really kick into gear and go higher, that could rectify itself. But for right now, it's a concern. I also include utilities down below as part of Dow theory, and these have been under pressure lately. This is a longer term look just at the transports where we finally broke out above this previous shorter term high. We still have this high to go back to in 2023. The all time high is back in 2021 and there's still a ways to go to get to that. This is a ratio between the transports and the S&P. When we really see some more solid upward moves with the S&P, it's usually when the transports are outperforming. They've been underperforming now, even though they're ticking back up recently. We want to see this turn and go up, and it just has not been doing that. And this is another warning sign to us. We compare the Dow with the transports and take a ratio. When this is going up, that means the Dow is outperforming. When this is going down, that means the transports are outperforming. And we're seeing a lot of choppiness right now. So this really isn't helping us all that much. We look at the relationship between the S&P 500 and the transports, and they're fairly strong right now. The higher this correlation chart is, the more strong that they're going in the same direction at the same time. Well, we're seeing the S&P going up and setting all-time highs. We have seen some improvement with the transports, which is helping the relationship, but we're still seeing that longer-term negative divergence. Then we look at a new idea behind Dow theory, where instead of using the Dow, we use the S&P 500. And instead of using the transports, we use the NASDAQ. And we look for convergences and divergences here where they're still going up. And on a shorter term basis, they seem to be converging with each other, which means they're confirming things. But we're setting all-time highs with the S&P. We're not setting all-time highs with the NASDAQ. So if we could come back and set an all-time high here, that would be a longer term confirmation. The FANG index continues to set all-time highs pretty much every day this past week. Then if we do start to fall, I have some different resistance levels here for the FANG index just to see, okay, will this offer some kind of support areas here? This once was resistance, now it has become support. ARC, again, it's in a longer-term uptrend. It was seeing some strength in the month of December. It's since been pulling back. There's really a lot of bashing going on right now about ARC and how it's lost all kinds of money for people and everything. Um, I mentioned that, I think in the weekly video, that sometimes when things get really bashed and you hear nothing but bad press, that might be a time to actually kind of consider it. I haven't done extensive research on that. This is just a few Twitter posts that I noticed and a few articles that I've seen here and there. Um, if ARC is something that interests you, I would have you do some more research on that. I look at it just to see how is this acting. It's a popular investment. A lot of people were very disappointed by it. And I just, since it's such a big deal to a lot of people that watch these videos, I like to include this chart. Then we look at a longer term chart. This is a monthly chart of the S&P 500 to stocks in Europe, Australia, Asia, and the Far East. When this is going up, that means that the S&P is outperforming and we're above an advancing moving average. So longer term, this is still quite positive. The momentum is also positive as measured by the PPO. We look at bonds as well. This is the total bond ETF. These are bonds based on price, not on yield. And we are in an uptrend with the total bond ETF. We're also in an uptrend, even though we're chopping around, going up and then coming back down. When we look at the world bond index, a longer term chart, comparing stocks to bonds, showing that stocks are outperforming. This is a shorter term daily chart showing how bonds continue to underperform stocks. And we look at high yield corporate bonds, which are junk bonds, and they continue to do quite well, but they're not quite back to setting all time highs, at least yet. We look at investment grade bonds, which are more conservative. They're also in an uptrend and they have a long ways to go to get back to their all time high. We do a ratio between riskier bonds and more conservative bonds. When this is going up, folks are favoring the riskier bonds 
because they're willing to take on that risk to get a higher yield or a higher return on that. If we start to see interest rates top out and begin to come down, we would likely see this ratio start to go down as people are switching into more conservative bonds and locking in a longer term yield. We do a correlation between stocks and bonds, and they're having a tendency to go in opposite directions right now. We look at the corporate bond index, which is still in an uptrend, even though for most of 2024, it's been chopping sideways so far. This is the 10-year yield, which had been coming down nicely. We topped out at a 5%. This is when we bottomed in stocks. And as this was coming down, that's when we saw the S&P really going up. Well, we got into 2024 and interest rates are starting to gyrate a little more and lately have been going up. And this is a little bit of a concern because we have the S&P setting all-time highs and going above 5,000 while interest rates are going up, which hasn't really been the story lately. They've had more of a tendency to go in opposite directions. So what's going to happen there? Does that mean stock prices are going to have to come down if interest rates keep going up? Or are interest rates going to come down to help stock prices go up? Then this is a longer term look at the 10-year treasury yield. We were coming up to 5% and coming back down. Now we're coming back over the 4% area. What we're trying to figure out with this chart is we saw a 40-year time period where we saw lower highs and lower lows, and we shifted into a lower interest rate environment, kind of culminating in the COVID crash. Well, since that time, <clears throat> we're trying to figure out, are we shifting back more into a higher interest rate environment? It was looking that way. And then when we started to come down in October, it's like, well, maybe we're not headed that way after all. But now with interest rates starting to go back up, we kind of have to say, well, maybe we are. This is a long-term story that we have to kind of watch unfold as it's happening. Then this is a chart that I've used many times. When we hit that 5% level back in October, that's over here on the right-hand side. And this is when the market started to really become convinced that we're going to see a soft landing economically, meaning that even though we've been seeing economic slowdowns, we're not going to go into a recession. The market really likes that. They also started to get this idea that the Fed was either done raising interest rates and possibly even at the point of starting to lower interest rates. And so that's when we saw this really coming down. Unfortunately, when you look at this chart, we have two other events where we saw a real spike down like this. The one that we saw last October, that could be taken as positive. These other two were negative. This was the Euro crisis that happened back in 2011. And then, of course, the COVID plunge, which happened back in 2020. Well, this, you have two negative events and one positive event. And so we're like, okay, it's, no, we're not really seeing a consistent theme here. Now, there have been some banks that have been coming out. One bank in particular, New York Community Bank, they're having some problems. Their stock price just got hammered. We're wondering, is that an isolated case? Is that just the beginning of other banks going to come out and start saying, oh, we're having problems too? Is that going to fit over into the financial sector? Is that going to bleed over into the interest rate markets? We don't know that. We just want to be aware of these things right now. And then as new things come to us, we can add to the overall scenario. Here's the 30-year yield, which also went up over 5%, started to pull back, and now it's starting to go back up. Then we compare the S&P 500 with the 10-year Treasury yield, where for most of 2024, even though the S&P has been going up, we're now seeing interest rates going back up. So we've been chopping more or less sideways, but longer term, we're in an uptrend when you compare the S&P 500 with the 10-year yield. This is three to seven year bonds and then comparing them with stocks. When this is going down, that means the bonds are underperforming. So even though interest rates have been going back up based on price, even though bonds have been bouncing back down as far as price, stock prices have been going up and that's why we're seeing this ratio really going down. Here's the junk bond ETF, which continues to be in an uptrend and is not back to setting an all time high yet. We look at the junk bonds and compare them with more conservative government bonds, showing that the junk bonds are outperforming. When there started to be a shift and thinking, okay, maybe we've topped out with interest rates, that's when we started to see this ratio coming down. Now it's starting to go back up. If we hit a point where the market feels like maybe interest rates have hit their highs, the Fed's going to start coming in and lowering rates then we would likely see this ratio begin to come back down. But until then, we'll probably see this ratio keep going up. 
Then we look at the price of the 7 to 10 year treasury bond ETF, where it has been under pressure lately, even though it's in a longer term uptrend. We have dropped below 50 with the RSI, and on a, on a momentum basis, we are negative. Here's a daily chart of the yields across all the different maturities. This shows how interest rates were coming down. We started to go sideways, and now we're going back up when we, as we get further into February. This is a weekly chart looking internationally. The U.S. rates and U.K. rates, those are the highest. German rates, that's in blue, and Japanese rates are in red. All of these have been going back up lately. We look at the move index, which measures the volatility of bonds on top. Then we compare it with the VIX, which measures the volatility of stocks. But their correlated relationship is pretty much neutral right now. When it gets near this midpoint, that means that there's nothing really decisive going on. When we get a high reading, that means they're going in the same direction. When we get a low reading, that means they're going in opposite directions. Here's a monthly chart of the price of the 30-year bond, where it still continues to be in a longer-term downtrend. But when you compare it to commodities, the ratio down below, bonds are still outperforming. But this is a very long-term chart. Then we look at different sectors and compare it with the S&P, where materials continue to underperform the S&P. Communication, which has been one of the stronger areas, it's been outperforming the S&P. Energy, which did great in 2022, not so good in 2023, it started to show some weakness, and so far in 2024, continues to underperform. <clears throat> the financials, which is, we're coming up almost on a year now, where we had that financial, the banks starting to say, uh, we're having some problems here. We saw the whole ratio really go down. Then we chopped sideways. We started to see some improvement here, but now we're seeing a bit of a pullback, wondering, is there still more news to come? The industrials continue to underperform the S&P. Tech sector, that's one of the stronger areas. It's outperforming the S&P. Staples are underperforming the S&P. Real estate is really underperforming the S&P. As interest rates were coming down, we saw real estate start to bounce back up. But now that interest rates are going back up, we're seeing this start to go back down. Utilities are also really underperforming the S&P. Here's a ratio reversing that where we show the S&P to utilities when this is going up, that means the S&P is outperforming, and quite often that's when the S&P does go up. Healthcare also is in a downtrend compared to the S&P, and also this chart shows how it's been underperforming. Discretionary is underperforming the S&P. This is an area of concern. We want to see discretionary outperforming the S&P if we're more positive. The fact that this is underperforming, even though it's bouncing back up lately, we want to see this turn and start to go back up to turn more positive. The staple sector, which if we were looking good economically, we would tend to see this going down. Actually, it's been going back up and we're seeing a recent golden cross here with the staple sector. The tech sector continues to be pretty much the strongest area of the market and it's really in a solid uptrend. The semiconductor is also strong and in a pretty solid uptrend, setting new all-time highs. The tech sector to S&P 500 ratio shows how tech is outperforming. Then when we compare energy to tech, this shows how energy is underperforming the tech sector. But in 2022, energy was outperforming the tech sector. We look at growth and compare it with bonds, showing how stocks, growth stocks, are outperforming bonds based on price. The tech sector to the rise in interest rates, we are seeing some improvement as the tech sector is outperforming, even though interest rates lately have been going back up. There's an inverse of that same chart showing how the 10-year is yield is underperforming the tech sector. Discretionary to staples, another kind of pseudo dis growth versus value area. This shows that discretionary is outperforming. It's in an uptrend, but we are not seeing the strength that we would like to see here, but it has been bouncing back up lately. Here's an inverse of that same chart showing how staples have been underperforming discretionary. Gold has been underperforming the S&P. The S&P has been going up. Gold has been in an uptrend, but not really breaking out. And gold has also been going down when compared to the U.S. dollar. Then high leverage loans. These are very risky loans. They continue to go up and are setting new all-time highs with this ETF. The NYSE composite we use for a broad market measure. It's also in an uptrend, not quite back to previous all-time highs. All stocks are setting new all-time highs. 
and this is in a solid uptrend. Emerging markets chopping more or less sideways between being in an uptrend and in a downtrend. And here's another look at a ratio when we look at emerging markets and compare it with U.S. stocks. And this is a few weeks old now where we're seeing the ratio really coming down, which sometimes marks some kind of a bottom where folks say, OK, now emerging market stocks are looking attractive enough. We're going to go in and start buying those. But this could still start to even drop lower as it did back in the 50s and then in the 60s. So and we are seeing some inflows into the emerging markets as far as money going into those areas. Then here's just some. And this is a bit outdated now as well. These are different company ETFs. If you want to break out and just invest in different international types of ETFs, the red line here is the US. So you can see kind of a comparison with how these other markets have been performing. And then I'm also been including this because Bank of America is rather bullish when it comes to the Japanese stock market. They're anticipating that we're going to go back and get to these highs set back in 1989. Haven't quite done that yet, but that's what their projection is. Here's the micro caps, which are above 100 and are also in an uptrend. These are the really small stocks. And then we look at the home builders ETF. We're not really getting anything all that useful from this chart, so I won't spend a lot of time going through that. We are in an uptrend with Bitcoin. It started to fall back. Now it's been coming back up as of late. Then we look internationally where China is showing some improvement. The emerging markets are starting to turn back up. Europe is actually still in a downtrend. We're trying to turn up with Japan and we're turning back positive in the U.S. This is an intermarket analysis chart just going back to the beginning of 2024 where a week ago oil was negative. Now it's back to looking the best. Then we have stocks, that's the black line, the dollar, which is the green line, and then gold and the price of bonds are still negative on the year so far. We look at different correlations. First, we look at the S&P 500 with a correlated relationship to the dollar. They're having a tendency to go in the same direction, which is kind of strange. The dollar's been bouncing up and the S&P's been going up, and that's why we're seeing this correlated relationship pretty strong. Typically, they have a, a real strong tendency to go in opposite directions of each other. We also look at the correlation between the S&P 500 and oil, where it's neutral right now. The S&P to the 10-year yield going in the same general direction. This is what I'm talking about, where the S&P has been going up and interest rates have been going up. It, what's the market going to do to try to rectify that? Because that, that's kind of a strange thing to have happen. We look at the tech sector and compare it with the 10-year yield. Also, a pretty strong tendency to go in the same direction. We look at the two-year yield. Also, pretty strong correlated relationship in the same direction. Some long-term studies here. This is a monthly chart of the NYSE. We're above the moving average, so that's positive longer term. The Coppic curve, which we use to measure momentum, is also looking positive. Then here's a daily chart, and we're showing the NYSE record high percent index continuing to go up. So that's positive on a shorter term basis when we look at the broad market. This is the S&P 500, a monthly chart. We're above the moving average, so longer term, we're still holding up. We look at the PPO, it's continuing to go up as well. So the longer term trend of the S&P is still looking positive. Then we compare the S&P on top and then a ratio between the S&P and commodities on the bottom. This is showing how the S&P is outperforming the commodities on a longer term basis. Then here's the S&P and then another global measurement that we use. This is the ratio on top showing how the S&P is outperforming. We're trying to cross here with the KST. This is a very long term oscillator. And this is a long-term chart, so it takes a long time for these to actually cross over, but it is turning a bit more positive. Then at the end of this, I list all the things that are positive, and we have quite a long list right now. My definition of positive as it applies to this particular video is when the 50-day simple moving average is above the 200-day simple moving average. We have the growth indexes as well as the value indexes when you take them by themselves, even though growth is outperforming value on a ratio basis. Copper is just chopping around. Sometimes it's in an uptrend. Sometimes it's in a downtrend. The British pound and the euro, even though the dollar has been bouncing back up, they're still in longer term uptrends when compared to the dollar. Gold is in an uptrend. The biggest software companies, the mega caps, the FANG index, ARC, 
The low volatility ETF, even though it's really underperforming the S&P, Staples, this is a new addition to the list. We just saw a recent golden cross there. The Dow Jones Composite Average, which is mainly getting its strength from the Dow, and all the different bonds based on price that we look at. The total bond ETF, the high yield of junk bond ETF, investment grade bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, and world bonds. The tech sector and semis, they're in solid uptrend, setting new all-time highs. High leverage loans, the Dow, the NYSE, that's a broader market measure. The NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100, the mid caps, small caps, and micro caps. All stocks, emerging markets, and then at the very bottom is Bitcoin. These are all the things that are currently positive. We have a much shorter list when we look at the negative things, which is when the 50-day simple moving average is below the 200-day simple moving average. The dollar is still in a downtrend, even though it's been recovering nicely since the beginning of 2024. The CRB index is still in a downtrend. Silver is in a downtrend. And the Japanese yen when compared to the U.S. dollar. Thank you. I hope you found this helpful. Please feel free to check out the daily video that I post. I also post a weekly video. After this, I'm going to do a thing called the deep dive video, where I go through a bunch of different charts that I didn't really talk about in any of the videos. I also have some other charts that are unique just to that video. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the Super Bowl, and I will talk to you in the next video.